Welcome back to Myth Represented. This is the first episode of Japan, where we will be covering Shinto and a little bit of Buddhism, and actually even touching a little on Christianity as well, because if one thing Japan likes, it is mixing up numerous religions, combining them, making a sort of hodgepodge. If this is our first, um, so far the mythologies that we've done have been very ancient, and not that this isn't ancient, but the main difference would be that this is still a major religion of the world. This is still very much practiced, whereas Greek mythology and Norse mythology, it is still practiced, not as mainstream. So we had a lot more research going into this, and like Gabe mentioned, we're, we have a couple, you could say, religions or faiths or practices that kind of melted together. Each one we could almost do a mythology of. We're kind of going to start with some of the basics of Shintoism itself, the very the oldest myths from Japan. And as we'll go through our episodes, more and more, even just in the first episode, we will throw in some of the bits of Buddhism and I believe in Taoism that kind of start to affect the myths. And a lot of even the, the original Shinto myths came from slightly older Chinese myths that they kind of, you know, jumped the water and some of the gods, some of the stories you'll find are very similar because they did originate in um, the mainland China. But again, we're just going to try and focus on China. We'll do another episode. We want to get down to Shintoism and the old gods of Japan. So, like every episode, we start with, ta-da, creation. And for the Shintoism, we have the books, the Kochiki and the Neon Shoki. And these were not necessarily their Bible, but just two books that were later where these stories were recorded, and that's where we got to get a lot of this information. And between the two books, there's some discrepancy in numbers of gods and names of gods, but we've been there, done that before. So we start with, like usually, nothing. This nothing was kind of a whirling, oozing sea of nothing. Sort of like a primordial ooze or an ether of sorts. Yeah, like, yeah, just kind of... Sounds slightly unpleasant, but it makes me think it's sticky. Like, I need a wet nap after years. creation. Like, just, just one of those little wet naps after wings or something. Just <laughs> get all that primordial goo off your fingers. But out of that comes... It's kind of like this... Also an egg shape in some mythologies, or stories of it. So you have a gelatinous primordial goo egg. Like a big fish egg? Sort of yeah. Stuff. We'll go with that. Um, as I was... Reading a bit, I've noticed, you said in some mythologies, one thing I noticed about Shintoism in my research is you have multiple versions of the stories. You're never going to get one definitive Shinto myth. So there's there's so many alternate storylines, alternate beginnings, alternate ends of things. Once again, a very eclectic mythology in Japan. So much of it was an oral tradition before these books kind of recorded it. So, like you said, we have so many versions, depending on what I mean, island mm-hmm. you came from. Even just same island, different town, you kind of had some of this. Stories being passed around a lot, combined with other stories, too. Yeah. There's a lot of that in the Far East. We'll see that a lot in some of oh, one of the mythologies we're working on, too, as well, was the Egyptian mythology, where same, similar thing. You have your creation stories very similar, but the names are different, depending on what area code you had at the time. So, now, also, too, that we have this egg of goo. Now, right where some of the discrepancies come in of certain gods started to form out of this. We have this, with it being a liquid state of nothingness, things started to settle, very much like a bottle with oil. The, the oil, say, floating to the top, and the, the grittier bits sinking to the bottom. And that kind of formed their cosmos. The pretty, you know, when you drop oil in water and it makes it all pretty and like a little psychedelic acid trippy. Yeah, that psychedelic acid trippy part, they were like, hey, that's a pretty part. That went to the top and made the heavens. Where the gritty kind of stuff that is like, mm, yeah, that just sank to the bottom and that's later going to become pretty much us in our world. So we, were, so we weren't part of the solution? Oh, we were part of the dear. precipitate? Oh. <laughs> and the puns come out. I'm not apologizing, as per usual. A thousand years ago, or from now, when someone's doing a po- podcast of mythology, they're going to stumble upon us, and you will be the god of awful puns. 
I will. Awfully delightful. The most hated god. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have this kind of... This things coagulate at the top, other things sink at the bottom. Now, from there, out of the heaven section, we have some gods that start to arrive. The, the, the plane itself is the Takama Nohara, which is the high plane of heaven. And, like I said, that's basically ho- heaven is an oil slick. And then three gods pop out of this white cloud. You have Amino Mina Kansuki, the lord of the center of heaven. Then you have Taka Mimsubi, August High producer, and Ku, excuse me, Kami Mushubi, August Divine producer. So you have the Lord and Creator, the August High, and the August Divine. Now here's where it gets a little hairy too. Depends on again region stories. Even later, once these thing stories were put into books, between the two books they had different numbers of generations. It was said there were certain, say, nine generations, each one having being a set of gods. It kind of just gave to the next. None of them really were gods of anything specific, nor were they technically the creator gods. That was what title was given slightly later, that once these kind of generations of god, I figured they were like the early kind of trial and error gods, until they kind of got to a point where they went, all right, we're kind of bored. We need something. It's usually how most of our creation myths have had, they whether it's boards, the titans, worlds. whether it's frost giants, whoever. The gods are sitting up there and finally just like, you know what? We need something to entertain ourselves. So just remember, you, us, everybody, we are just the reality show for gods that got bored. They were tired of just their own lives. Like, let's watch somebody else's horrible experience and tune in every week. We're just a big game of The Sims. Pretty much. We're an MMO. <laughs> with really shitty graphics. Or no, good graphics, but really shitty gameplay. Yeah. So, now for the rest of the episode, I'm just... Whenever I look at you, I see that weird green diamond floating over you. Yes. So... It's actually reality. Your eyes have just been open to it. Damn it. After these deities kind of... These generations don't really do much. They go, okay, we need... Somebody needs to do something. So next we have Izagami, the male. Izanami, the female. This is where the gods finally start making a name for themselves and get, okay, a lot less boring. They are chosen slash... They get... They were just basically... They, was demanded of them. We need something at cool. Make something. So they descended down. Now at this point, we still basically just have the heavens above and below is still kind of the primordial primordial waters. So Izanagi and Izanami kind of climb down this bridge, sometimes set as a rainbow, much like Bifrost in our previous myth tellings of the Norse. And they get a spear in Aginata. It's called Ami no Nuboga. And it's this magical jeweled sword, or spear, I should say. And what they do is the two start to stir up these primordial waters. Much like I just pictured Bubble Bubble Toil and Trouble playing in the background. And as they pull out the spear, kind of bits of the the sediment are on there. And as it falls, it's said that that's what started to create the islands. Now, in some myths, it's even said that their union they gave birth to, instead of like a supernatural being of children, it was the islands of Japan. So, awesome. They come down, they make this land, they've got land. Still not really all that entertaining. Nothing on it. Nothing on it yet. So they end up making this giant pillar to heaven, and they decide, one of my favorite, just like, we have so many of our other deity stories of, you know, they just love to bang, and they just, they inherently, that just the gods, they just pop up, they instantly know either how to wage war, make magical weaponry, or fuck. These two are just delightfully naive. And they're just standing there one day, hanging out by this pillar, and they're bored, and Izanagi looks down at his lower nether regions and goes, Well, what do you know? I have a bump there. I wonder what that does. And Izanami goes, Well, damn, I ain't got a bump, but shit, I got a hole. And... It makes me wonder how, like, again, just this delightful bot play-by-play back and forth. How long did it take the two of them sitting back and forth going, Okay, bump, hole, any howdy, bump, okay, you, plug, out, okay. okay. 
how did long they try did they... other appendages first? I'm or wondering. Did they just go with the appendages that had the most differences? I, I guess that was just they both looked down, their eyes were totally different, and they, yeah, I don't know what they tried first. So they're like in a, a strange origins mythology. All right, you've got extra bits. I'm lacking in bits. So let's push them together. Not lacking. They're internal. Yeah. But they're like, let's push them together. Let, let's put them together and see what happens. And, well, she, she, she's pregnant. Um, ta-da! That's what happens. But That's what those are for. At somewhere in between this, you've got a bump, you're lacking a bump, there's a pickup line. I, I think we need to develop this and try this <laughs> out. So, this divine pillar, they decide that they're going to walk around this, and this is their union. This is kind of their marriage. This is the almost even their procreation. Um, so, they walk around, and... When they meet at the other side, Izanami, the female, looks at Izagani and goes, Hey, you know, mm -hmm, how you doing? She's the first to speak and compliments him. He proceeds to compliment her back. They go, they put their opposite bits together. She's pregnant. Now, I see nothing wrong with this. They, She compliments him. He goes and compliments her back very gentlemanly. She's a very progressive woman to speak first and ends up having babies. Problem was, was... That, um, baby number one, Hairuku, uh, also known as Leech Child, mm. came out this festering, sometimes described as jellyfish, sometimes octopus, sometimes, or just Leech Baby. Like, when your title thousands of years later is Leech Baby, I'm gonna ju kind of assume that you were not, probably. You did not come out as planned. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. He later kind of somehow has becomes a Bishu which is one of these seven main gods of luck. And again, these seven gods are acknowledged in Shinto mythology. Six of them were pretty much just renamed Chinese gods, this one being the only original Shinto app, Japanese one. So they're like Leech Baby. And Izagami, the dad's like, mm -mm, ugly, not so much. They put it in a basket and just throw it out in the primary and you'll see. Now, it was like, okay, they're just giving him a second chance, but I'm going at the same time. You people just, according to yourselves, just created the only land. And you just pushed him away from the only land. You just damned this kid to... Not really that much of a second chance. Yeah. It? It's just an infinite, endless abyss. You Good just... luck, kiddo. Yeah. We no, don't really have much of a schooling system here or <laughs> parenting going on. We're just going to kind of set you adrift on the sea. So then they tried again, and out came Awashima, the Pale Island. Not a lot of mythology behind him as much. Sometimes it is said that he developed into a, just a island. But again, he was another ugly baby. Not a very motivated kid. No. So he has going to be land. A leech baby, and I'm just going to sit here. People can build stuff on me. I was going to say, come on me and do stuff, but that just turned the, this I mean, the rating just like... Technically, yeah, what is our rating? Hey, that's true. <laughs> do we even have one? No. So they realized, well, shit, Wait, there's something wrong here. We just tried twice, and these babies are coming out fugly. So? Oh, the third one's going to come out fine, right? No, well, yeah. They go up to the gods, and here's where I really uh, love and have an affinity towards the Shinto beliefs of the very natural way of things, the spirits and all things. It's personally, for myself, it is one of, one of the religions, one of the spiritualities, because a lot of People don't even consider Shintoism a set religion. It's more of a spirituality, a way of life. I really like it. My only beef is this part, where they go to find out what was done wrong. And the other generations of God, they didn't even have, they didn't even like blink, they didn't have to think about it. They're like, bitch, it's because you opened your mouth first. Oh. And there is a guy, is an army's like, well, what, what do you mean? So much for progressive. Yeah. Well, you. The one missing the parts. Uh, you're a girl, so how dare you speak first? That's why your babies are coming out fucking mutants. So I'm sure she just kind of sighed. And they went back down, did the whole let's dance around the pole again. Uh, not that way. Like, she's not a... They hadn't done this yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's not amateur night. Um, but anyway, they walked around, said Pole. This time, Izagami saying, hey, how are you doing first? And she's by like, this fine. point, yeah, she says it's like, great, thanks, you look, you look fine too, let's just get this over with. And, what do you know, it works, and they have babies. Now here again is where it kind of gets hairy of who, how many babies, some from natural birth, some from, we'll get to that. But 
the next baby comes out and is Kagusuki, the fire god. Now, easy birth, right? Well, yeah, this is the thing. And this is where I'm going, okay, this is where if only it would have been like the Marvel Universe and mutants. Some of the X-Men would come out with horns, on fire, whatever. But the thing is, the, the way they kind of made that work was that mut- mutation didn't happen until puberty. So we were born normal, so you didn't risk the mother's life. And then later your powers developed when your head lit on fire or claws or tusks or bat wings sprouted. Or, as is often said, family members are immune to other family members' powers. Yes. That's an often... Oh, yeah. Havoc and just used. Cyclops back and forth. So lame. This, <laughs> they didn't figure that out. God of Fire basically just came out like a screaming human torch and on fire. She was not immune and just incinerated her junk, basically. Uh. Her entire lower regions, there was, it was just, uh-uh, not pleasant. And it ended up killing her. I'd imagine. Boom, dead. So she ends up, she did. She's now on her way to Yomi, the underworld. This, this, this was supposed to work out better this time, wasn't it? Like, well, it didn't work out because you talked first. All right, now this time you're just going to die, die. Now, right? Yeah. Not a lazy child, not a gelatinous child. You're dead. But at least I guess he wasn't ugly. He was a pretty flaming baby. Yeah, but she I don't, died. I, yeah. <laughs> but, and then, now the father. Izagami, I'm sure, is grief-stricken, and you think he would, you know, he's just... I, I get, okay, grief-stricken, you're a little out of your mind, but he blamed... Looks at it as the baby. It was your fault you're on fire, and my wife is dead. So he got a sword and chopped the baby up into lots of little pieces. He one finally was. gets a child that at least has all its appendages, looks normal, other than apparently being on fire, and then takes out the rage on the baby. The baby who had, you know, didn't say, hey, I'm going to come out of mommy's womb on fire and torture Crotch to death, and the rest of her to death. No, but kills her. Out of it said, some say he was cut into three pieces, some five pieces. Regardless, he was then, his pieces turned into other deities. He somehow remained a deity. Um, But yeah, that's about that. So after he's done chopping up his only child, he then snaps to me and goes, oh, shit, that's right, dead wife. I should maybe go to the underworld to see if I can get her back. Great. So ends up at one point getting a comb, putting on fire, and travels through Yomi, the underworld. Now... This is one of those, with our ancient myths, the underworld is in a horrible place. Yomi's not real at this time. Uh, great. It's not real pleasant. It's just land of the dead. So it's corpsey, dark, dank, I imagine, moist sounds as you walk along. <laughs> and other various unpleasant adjectives. Yeah. It's so squishy and sticky. Yeah. So he gets goes through Yomi and finally finds his wife, Izanami. Now... She says, look, okay, you found me? It's 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 dark. He cannot see her. She's like, she tells him numerous times, don't look at me. It ain't pretty. If you remember, we last saw each other. My crotch was incinerated. Probably the rest of her. I've been kind of rotting here for a while while you were chopping up our baby. So I'm not pleasant to look at. Please don't. We all know how well men listen. Yeah, he's like, ah, sure, honey. Yeah, no problem. Proceeds to get the nearest thing he can to light on fire. Lights it. Looks at her. <laughs> Bitch was not exaggerating. She is incinerated, melty, maggots crawling out of every previous orifice, and now all the probably newly made orifices that from rotting. She's the you know, worst of zombies. Yes, highly unpleasant. Now, but again, because he did this, she is now really pissed. Like you just saw me at my worst. I wish you would. You know, I had faith in you. I trusted you that you would not see me this way. So that I could maybe return back to my beautiful self. No. She freaks the fuck out and goes after him. Now, again, this is kind of a, wow, they need counseling. But what deities that we've mentioned haven't needed counseling? Mm -hmm. He could have tried to smooth her over. He could have tried to work it out. Maybe, I'm sorry, I looked, you know. It's really not that bad. Like, the maggots are kind of, they bring out your eyes. Um, You don't look fat in that rotting dress because... You just don't look bones. fat when you're horribly emaciated. Yeah. Most of your flesh is slot off. He could have been smoother about it and talked it over. But what did he do? He turned around, ran screaming like a bitch. Ran so fast. And at this point now, she's like, motherfucker, I'm just going to take you out. And goes running after him, probably with murderous intent. And at this point, I don't really blame her. Um, so he finally gets to the entrance of 
the uh, Viomi and back into the our world, Earth realm. And apparently at one time it was just an open door. Well, at this point, he now just got out of it and is going, fuck this open door policy, grabs the biggest fucking rock he can find, throws it in the hole, and now poor Izanami, that is why, basically, you know, the living and the dead can't go back and forth together, we cannot see each other. It's because he didn't want to deal with his bitching wife anymore, so he blocked the damn door to the afterlife. All his fault. Always dealing with her blowback, these deities. Yeah. So now she's down there, she is motherfucking pissed. Now apparently she can't get out, but she's still screaming through that door. She's like, listen. She goes, what you've done, I'm going to kill 1,000 people a day. Everybody you create, I'm going to murder. So, Once again, his response... It out on us. No, to me, his response could have gone, well, you know, you're a creator god, you can pretty much do anything. He could have said, well, I'm going to put up a force field. You know, like most five-year-olds in the playground. Or he could have said, well, I'm going to make them immune to you. Or he could have had options. No. His way of fixing it is, all right, you're going to kill a thousand people a day? I'll just make sure a thousand and five hundred are born every day. So I come out ahead by five hundred a day. So I'm looking at that. Oh, okay, that works. You know, that works. The same I've been going, you're just basically letting her eat a thousand <laughs> people a day. But you've made a couple extra... So, there's at least some left over. Once again, we're just sims to them, and consider how we treat our sims when we play or how, unfortunately, I've treated some of them. I've actually been pretty nice to my sims, but some of the stories I've heard, you know, if when we're gods, we do it too. Yeah, if... Anyway. If that... Deities would look down on how I played sims, they would not let me in the club. <laughs> or would they make me their god because of the horrible things I did do? Huh, I don't know. But so now, now we have why there's life and death. It's There is death because Inagami's pissed at, his, at her husband and is just slaughtering people daily. And there's only life because he's just making just enough daily. To come to, out on top. Yeah, to come out on top. Now, at this point, so now we have... She's in the underworld, he's in on Earth. We've got the island set up. We've got life, death. We have have some deities here and there. It was said even when she... As she was dying, she cried tears. Those became gods. And at one point before even they had the children of the fire god, that they, you know, they got hungry, so they created a rice deity. And they got bored, so there was another wind deity when uh, Sukiyami breathed a sigh of relief. But right now, most of these gods, short of Izagami and Izanagi themselves, aren't hugely main characters. But now is when we get three of our main characters. Because Izagami was like, that place was disgusting. I still feel the death, or the, the, the grossness of that place. I'm still sticky. He needs a wet nap. He goes into the river and bathes himself. And out of, it's said that somehow out of it is just bathing. He, I believe his eyes came Amatras. Amatrasu, the sun goddess. Out of his mouth came Sukiyomi, the moon god. And out of his sweat or tears, it's, again, random orifices gave birth to random gods, depending on where you came from. The third child was Susanoo, the god of storms and the sea. These three will be basically the, the main characters of the next, say, our next episode where we do all the legends. They are the big key players. Uh, Amatras takes her place as goddess of the heavens, as the goddess of the sun. And it's even her child that becomes the first emperor of Japan. And it was, it's even still believed today that the emperor family is still part of this lineage. And descended from the gods? Descended from the gods. Now, what's interesting is another myth of why there's mortality in... Despite... Because some people could say, well, if these emperors are descended from gods, why, why aren't they immortal? <laughs> A funny story. So, Jinmu... Um, other names I'd found, too. The First Emperor. We're going to call him First Emperor. Matras' kid. He's now sitting on Earth, big old throne, funny hat with lots of beads on it. Which must be a bitch on a windy day. Like, that's just got to be annoying. Anyway, the, the other gods offered him... I'm not exactly sure where they came from, but they offered him a princess. Princess Brilliant Blossoms. Um, sounds like a My Little Pony character. <laughs> not going to lie. So... He's like, she is gorgeous. I, 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 she is going to be my princess. This will be my wife. And the god's like, mm, 
this is actually a two for one special. And he's like, holla fucking Louia, this is I, this is awesome. Bring her in. So they bring in now, just by the name, Princess Brilliant Blossoms, I'm gonna say she's probably banging. Like she's probably hot. There's probably constantly a shower of flowers following her every Oh she yeah. Goes. She just smells pretty, she looks pretty. Um well then um Princess number two comes in. What's her name? Princess Long as Rocks. That leaves a lot <laughs> to the imagination, and the imagination is going strange places. Yeah, like, how do you take that? Brilliant Blossom, you just think pretty. Princess Long as Rocks? What the hell? I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, she's probably not hot. According to the stories, she wasn't pretty. She had, like, a snaggle tooth, a lazy eye, a hairy mole that she probably could braid, like... From the sounds and of not it, the cute little saggle teeth that look like little fangs. Yeah, like, no, this was probably like a like tusk. A pile of stones. <laughs> so yeah, he decides that he's like, you know what? I'm cool with just one. I, really, I'm fine. And the guy's like, you sure you don't want this one? She's <laughs> she's lovely. She's long and rock like. And he's like, no, dude, I'm good. Thanks, but no thanks. I just I'll take my pretty princess. And I'm like, all right, fine. But, ha uh, you've just been pranked. It's like, wait, what? Turns out the pretty one, yeah, she's just mortal. Like, she's pretty, but she's going with her and die, and she's going to give the kids with her and die. Turns out, Princess Long as Rocks was a freaking superhero. She was held the gene of immortality. Uh, so, one of those kind of folklore stories of why do why does the family die? Why do we have mortality? Because he went for the pretty one over. We can, we'll go and say for, that for... The fleeting beauty rather than the enduring. Yes. Princess Long as Rocks will say had a lovely personality. Which is the last thing what you want to hear when you're being hooked up on a blind date, because we all know what that ends up to turn out to, is that she ends up looking like a Princess Long as Rocks. But because he made the vain choice, that's why there's death. So we have our gods, Susanamo, Amatras, and Tsukiyomi. And that's out of these three, mainly two of the three, um, one just kind of sits back and watches the chaos. Those will stem into our legends to come next episode. All right. So Shintoism, those are the origins of part of the Japanese mythology. Also, now that, that's a sort of their native mythology. Mm-hmm. They also carry a lot of Buddhism with their traditions. And Buddhism is not originally from Japan. It's originally from India but they had the Vedic beliefs. So Buddhism almost sort of started in India and then spread and slowly wrapped around the world. and doesn't really have a place of origins that it predominates, but it's sort of everywhere. And interesting thing with Buddhism, you know, one thing I had heard is in Japan, you're born Shinto, you marry Christian, and you die Buddhist. Shintoism very much is the life-affirming, life-giving everything's alive religion. Um, Christianity, of course, centers around a lot of vows and promises. And then you have Buddhism, which centers very largely around death. Um, In episode three of Japan, we'll be talking a lot about afterlife. Once again, not not really a lot of apocalypse-related stuff in Japanese mythology, but more cyclical. So in Buddhism, Buddhism started... The Buddha was actually a prince... There's a caste system in India where you had the priests and the holy men at the very top. Then you had the warrior caste just below that. Then there were the farmers and the servants. And then you had the outcasts who, they were the ones who did the micro, who still do the micro dirty jobs type things and get treated like absolute shit, unfortunately. But the Buddha had been born a prince and born into the warrior caste. There was, originally his mother had been had a dream where there was a white elephant. The white elephant crawled into her side and she became pregnant. Or no, the the white elephant put a flower into her side. It was a divine birth. An immaculate conception. Uh, So it was said, she looked for the meaning of this, said to the holy man, what does this dream mean? He said, well, you're going to have a child and he will either be a holy man or a warrior, emperor, he will either spread and become a holy man, become like a god and spread enlightenment to the world, or he will conquer the world and become the emperor. That's a good 50-50 shot. Yeah. 
So you know, right away, it's great. It's, this is great. Things are going to come out very beautifully here. And his dad's like, warrior, emperor, take over the world. Booyah. <laughs> so he starts raising his son. He's like, okay, we're going to keep him in the palace and give him the best life. And he's going to conquer the world. And he was pampered like crazy. Every pleasure he ever wanted. Any food he wanted. The finest silks. The finest linens. Finest clothing. Finest everything. Um, surrounded constantly by beautiful women. Always receiving training. He was very good in the arts of archery and sword play, but he was also always very curious, always wanted to know everything about the world around him. And he had a lot of these tendencies to be want to learn, be enlightened. And he ended up going out on some trips with his horseman, or his charioteer, and he first encountered an old man. Now, he had been sheltered, very sheltered, knew nothing of the outside world, knew nothing of suffering, did not know what suffering was. And he said, what's wrong with him? And his charioteer said, oh, that's change. That happens to all of us. We all get old and die eventually. Hell no. And he's like, oh, huh. So we all get old and die. And then later, he goes out on another trip, and he sees a sick person. And he says to his charioteer, what's wrong with him? He said, oh, that he's sick. Anyone can get sick. That can happen to anybody. He's probably going to die. He thought, oh, suffering, sickness. I've never heard of this before. And then another time... He goes out, and he comes across a person there um, carrying a body, and it's the first time he's ever seen a person dead. And he says, what, what happened there? Why are they carrying this person wrapped in linen? Oh, he died. You know, death comes for us all eventually. And he's like, that's very sad. I never thought of these things till I left the palace. And then his fourth trip comes along. So in the Vedic beliefs, you have this cycle of life, death, and reincarnation. You're constantly on this wheel, over and over. And through every time you circle the wheel, you encounter suffering. So on his fourth trip, he sees a holy man, a monk, sitting there, praying. And he says, who's this man? He said, oh, he's a holy man. He's seeking to transcend life, death, and reincarnation, and thus all suffering, and become one with the gods. And he's like, that's what I'm going to do. And... Now, mind you, you've heard this This kid led a very extreme, very sheltered life, but he was also trained, being trained as a warrior, and he was the best at archery, the best at swordplay. He's the best of the best, because if there's one thing Buddha doesn't do is half-ass anything. Very well-rounded individual. Yes, especially in some depictions where he's very happy and rotund. <sighs> <laughs> the happy, fat Buddha. But this, we're, we're talking the more, the more lean, devout Buddha here. The one you typically see forged in gold and often reclining on his side. He goes out into the world, he sneaks out, he cuts off his hair, hands it to his charioteer, says, take this back to my family, let them know I've gone off to be a holy man. And he runs off to be a holy man. Now, in Buddhism, one of the big things in transcending pain and transcending death is to embrace suffering as a part of life. He went through numerous types of training, through numerous teachers. There were times where he deprived himself. I'll go more into this when we get to India, because um, asceticism is something I want to address there. But in a nutshell here, for our purposes, he goes through all these different forms of training to try to overcome suffering. He always does it so much better than any of his teachers. And eventually he then abandons that and begins to embrace life and say, this is not about torturing the flesh. That's not going to get us anywhere. And, and you know, we can keep embracing suffering, but really what we need to do is embrace life to let go. Buddhism is very much about letting go and overcoming suffering by simply casting off the different things that are bound to you. And this is very much permeated in... What's the cat doing? Cat! Okay. I'll edit that out. Or not. So in Japanese traditions, you have a lot of embracing of the pain of life. This is where Buddhism has had a lot of influence. There are celebrations in Japan where people will fight. It's like a giant mosh pit all day long, like a big, huge, 12-hour long mosh pit. Can I trade Christmas for that holiday? You can. Go to, you can go to Japan and you can jump into this. You can go to Japan and say, I want to participate in this holiday, and they will pull you in. There's a lot of 
it almost looks like fighting contention in their holidays, but it's about embracing and overcoming pain. And this is where Buddhism has gotten very much into the mythology, where you have all of the life-affirming things with Shinto, you also have in Buddhism the acceptance of death, the acceptance of transience, and the idea of moving on. And um, I, don't, I don't really have a lot of origin stories relating to this, but a lot of origins of concepts. Because once again, you said it, it's not really a lot like a religion, it's more a spirituality. And this is a huge thing with Japanese mythology. You know, when, you're, when your loved ones die, you continue to remember them. And the, your, your dead loved ones almost become like deities. It is interesting because, as you said, that Buddhism did cover a lot of the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Whereas the early Shinto myths did not. Our, our little fun story of the underworld, Yomi, and going back and forth with Izanami and Izagami, that was one of the few legends of it. And in the original Shinto beliefs, death was looked upon as what, really what it is. They took it for what it is physically. It's dirty, it's decaying, it's dead, it's done. They did not have a whole lot of afterlife, so it makes sense with what you said about Buddhism having that afterlife that they kind of were a good fit. It seemed a, like a natural flow for them yeah. to come together and work well. We have both the life affirming, the acceptance of the natural world, but yet now we have a little more to look forward to or be wary of in the afterlife. And the funny thing is, if you look at what is in the afterlife in Buddhism, it's never really addressed. It's that whole question of what happens after we die. Letting go of that question is a huge part of it. Hmm. There isn't really a lot of what happens after we die, even though that is the primary focus, at least in the Japanese view, of this is what we're, this is what our death rituals are based on. There's no answers to the questions, but rather learning to accept that we don't need answers to those questions. And I always really love that about Buddhism. You don't need the answers, and if someone claims to have the answers, they're usually ridiculed for being too proud. I like. I, I, I'm going to have to look this up. There's a there's a name for a type of story in Japan where it's made instead of like the cliche of like a story with a moral or a story with some sort of lesson to be learned. It's very ambiguous. The story ends with the whole point of it is to not make sense per se. Where it's just this, there's no real answer at the end of the story, and it's for you to kind of meditate upon and for you to think about. There's a lot of that in Zen of Cones. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, maybe. It is a Zen story. Yeah, there, there, is, there are questions and stories that are referred to as cones that they don't have answers for that reason. And actually, that's where haiku comes from. I, I feel like for episode one, we're going to be getting into a lot of culture, <laughs> just, <laughs> just talking about the, the different ground philosophies. With Katakana, I'm sorry, Tatanka poetry, you had five lines. Typically, and this is going to sound familiar, it, now this was actually the least important, but typically the syllables went seven syllables, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, seven syllables in one of these poems. The poem required two things to be compared in some way, some conclusion to be brought to. Now, what do you get if you cut off those last two lines? Seven syllables, five syllables, seven syllables. Sound a little more familiar in something maybe related to Zen arts? Haiku. Huh. Haiku is a traditional poem that's had the last two lines chopped off, and there was a game among Zen Buddhists to make a haiku and then try to come up with the last two lines. That and sounds like a fun drinking game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And... That's one thing I, I always loved about haiku, and unfortunately, most people, when they think haiku, they think 757, seven, and that's where it ends. And that's starting and ending with the least important aspect of the whole poetry, <laughs> because I've seen lots of poems written by masters in the haiku form that in the original Japanese still do not follow those syllable patterns. But it's, it's more about the posing of questions, and that's one of the biggest things I loved about learning about Zen Buddhism is it's, it's always about posing the questions and then spending the rest of your life looking for the answers. And it's that search, that journey, that makes you enlightened. It's not finding the answers at the end. Finding the answers at the end ends your journey, means you stop growing. So it's always about that never-ending journey for infinite truth. And it's infinite, so it's never-ending. 
Hmm. And right there is the origins of the end with Zen Buddhism, the other big chunk of mythology. I guess, I mean, Christianity will probably have to be its own five separate episodes. But yeah. then they have Christianity and marriage. Even that, I'll, I'll kind of spoil and bring up with the mention of Christianity coming through with Japan, the uh, Nobunaga, mm. which will be mentioned intensely in episode three when we talk about pop culture. Well, we're currently playing video games with Nobunaga in it, and it's interesting to see his how he turns out in because of pop culture what they do to him. <laughs> the this demon Christian, lord. yeah, myth, uh, missionary, and basically they they have that much respect for him. He's now a demon lord. Just yeah, numerous video games, numerous animes. I'll, well, I'll be talking about the uh, the Iga province ninjas a lot. Nice. The shinobi, because they had a special relationship with him, being he. Well, not really, I don't know, nin- ninjas I don't think really were hater types, but they were very strong dislikers. Really wanted him. to kill him? I mean, they really had to, because <laughs> it was how they survived. <laughs> so I think we've got a good setup for, like I said, this is our first uh, pantheon we're talking about that ha- is still being practiced now, and so we have to be a little more, I don't want to say careful, but just a little more re- research into it. Mm-hmm. So, and, and because where we had Greek, it was, you have this family of gods. With the Norse, you had this family of gods. Again, as we keep saying, this is a, an amalgamation of certain religions, certain spiritual beliefs, localized uh, belief systems that kind of melted together to form. Again, we're going to kind of focus on, you know, between our old Shinto, some of the Buddhism, and then combined it. And then we should be, we've got everybody together, and I think we'll be ready for episode too and get into some of these crazy legends and not just legends but the folklore in Shintoism. It's probably going to be mostly folklore because you have tons of folklore in Shinto and it's all amazing. It's great, beautiful things. Like we can, we'll be going from stories of these omnipotent gods doing crazy things to a point where an umbrella gets old enough and then murders your face. Like so many This is the beauty of it. Yeah. It's just urban legends left and right. Red cape, blue cape. I mean, all kinds of horror stories. I, I'm so excited. As immediately after doing this episode, I'm going right back upstairs to start writing number two. Like, there's no break. <laughs> I just need to get in to the crazy stuff. The Kappa? Yes. Anyway. Love Kappa. So, yes, the original Ninja Turtles. Ew! <laughs> I want to see the Ninja Turtles fight Kappa. Is we? Yeah, yeah, they could do it. But they how have they how not? Them. I don't know. We're Googling the shit out of this, then. I don't know. I feel like it could have happened in Eastman and Lear. But... <laughs> well, if we figure it out, we will be the first to let you know in the next episode. Absolutely. Stay tuned, and hopefully we will see you back for part two of Shinto Japanese mythology, and we might bring you Kappa's versus Ninja Turtles. <laughs> see you then. Take care. <laughs>